Welcome everybody and Hare Krishna for another session of Prabhupada Memoirs. And I am so thrilled that I have His Holiness Chandramuli Swami Maharaj with us here today. And for those uh, that may not know Maharaj, um, His Holiness Chandramuli Swami Maharaj is a, a direct disciple of Srila Prabhupada and an initiating spiritual master in our ISKCON movement. He came into contact with Krishna consciousness in Denver, Colorado at the age of 24. And in the night in the early 1980s, he became involved in the Iswan prison ministry uh, in the USA and began a visiting prisons, uh, visiting prisoners uh, and holding programs in jails, along with regular writing letters to them, to the inmates. And then sending them to Shila Prabhu and sending them Shila Prabhupada's books. And of course, he's been doing this tireless, tirelessly since then. And currently, he's based in Slovenia. And at present, uh, he's offering spiritual guidance around Europe, USA, and India. And on the back of all this, Maharaj is also an amazing writer from his experiences that he has uh, got through the years where he's created a book called The Holy Jail, especially with the prison service, and another book, which you can see on the top about the inner voices, uh, which we'll be talking about as well later on. So, Maharaj, thank you so much for joining us today. And how are you? Fine, thank you. It's nice to be with you. And everybody else who is out there in virtual land <laughs> yes we have about uh from the different platforms at the moment and they keep on joining about over 200 250 people on so thank you so much for joining and as we get into this this is about Prabhupada's memoirs hearing directly from the disciples of Srila Prabhupada so please any questions you have uh that you would like to ask his holiness Chandramuli Swami Maharaj then please do message them I can try and look in the chat box and then at a certain times, we will try and bring those questions up as well. So to get started, if I may. So 24, you started and you got in contact with Krishna consciousness. How did that come about, Chandramuli Maharaj? How did that happen? Well, going back uh, 40, almost 47 years, it's been a little, little blurry. But um, I met somehow or other uh, in my travels before I became a devotee. I wound up in a place called Denver, Colorado, looking for spiritual direction at that time, having heard from others that a place called uh, Boulder, Colorado, which is a, a city about one hour away by car from Denver, was sort of a mecca of spiritual ashrams from uh, personalities who had came from India. So I, I started to investigate a little bit in that area and then by Krishna's arrangement I happened to meet the devotees and wound up coming to the uh, program in the Denver, Colorado temple. <laughs> wow, so that's how it all started. And, um, you know, 24, you know, it's it's still, I know a lot of people, they start their Krishna conscious life a bit later on in life. And so 24, maybe in those days, but nowadays, I'm, I think it's quite a young time to really just get into it. And you, 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 then the next stages were that you went to New Vrindavan, if I'm correct, from there and did some services. Actually, I wound up in the New York temple, the Brooklyn temple, the famous uh, Henry Street temple which has so many memories of Srila Prabhupada. Um, that was in right after meeting the devotees in Denver, because I'm, I'm from the East Coast. I was from the area of New Jersey. So I returned to that area and then um, still having some uh, connection with the uh, devotees, uh, with the uh, process, I, I started to visit the temple in New York. Oh, I see. So that's how it then started to start to gain momentum in your spiritual life, I gather. And then uh, I happened to meet one personality who is also a, uh, 
very senior devotee in our movement and spiritual master and that was Devamrita Swami. Yes. Uh, he was also attending uh, the uh, Brooklyn temple so we became somewhat friends and due to our interaction uh, he sort of mentioned that there was a uh, farm community, a rural community in a place called West Virginia. So I became a little curious and by one, during one Sunday feast lecture I came in contact with the temple president at the time, who was Kuladri Prabhu. And uh, we talked, and uh, I liked the idea of trying New Rindavan, so I wound up going. So, so the city life was not, uh, the, the, should we say, the rural, the urban style, the rural style was calling you. Is that what it was? And then you thought... Yes. Yeah, actually, that, that's actually correct. I wasn't so much inspired to practice spiritual life in, in the cities. I thought of a more, more of a natural, you know, rural setting would be more, you know, pl pleasing and easier for me to practice spiritual life. Of course, I didn't know what I was getting into at the time. <laughs> it was just when we wound up getting there, we were, it was just working from morning till night <laughs> doing various chores. But it was, you know, that was the inspiration is to move away from the cities. Well, and, and it, we hear from speaking to some of the other Prabhupada disciples that, that it was a very quick process. It wasn't like, okay, I've come in contact with devotees. Then five years or six years later, we move into a temple. We start doing service. It was quite quick, wasn't it? This time frame from Denver, Colorado. Then you went to New York. From New York, you went to New Vrindavan. Um, what was that time span? Uh, that was actually very quick. Um, my actual connection in Denver it was in the later part of 1972 and then I wound up in New Vrindavan in uh, March of 1973 right. so um, spending a couple months in New York prior to that and then I was in West Virginia I was a farm boy <laughs> you might say <laughs> so, that, so now we're coming to 1973 because that's also when you were initiated um, at that time as well, if I'm correct, it was the year. It was in September of the same year. <laughs> wow! And and, did, and is that the first time you met Chila Prabhupada, uh, or did you hmm. see him before? No, my first encounter with Chila Prabhupada was in 1974, when he had come to New Rindavan for uh, a meeting with all the leaders. They chose New Vrindavan as a place to meet. And uh, the leaders from the different uh, temples, different yatras around America came to see Srila Prabhupada. And there was a, a two or three day festival where Prabhupada was there, gave classes and mostly met with his leaders and trying to inspire them in their service. They were given reports like that. So, of course, at that time, all I did was able, was able to see Prabhupada. It was nothing more than that. And um, I didn't have any personal interaction in 1974. It wasn't until actually 1976 when Prabhupada came in. the second time to New Vrindavan, or not the second time, but another time, was when I actually was able to uh, do some service for Prabhupada. And that service, I, 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 if I am correct, is this the Pera story? Well, that's how it's labeled, yeah. It's called the Pera story. But, uh, yeah, because I was a cook at the time. Oh, okay. And we were up in one of the areas in New Vrindavan. We had three small farms, one, one bigger farm and two smaller farms, uh, which were different areas of the New Vrindavan community. So the most distant place away from the main farm was a place called Vrindavan, which was about two miles through the woods, over streams, up hills, and wound up in this area. And there was a little shack there. Uh, Prabhupada had come there actually in 1968, the first time when New Vrindavan first began. 
And then again in 1969, Prabhupada stayed there for actually a month in the same place that we uh, made that our temple in our ashram. It was only one building at the time. And then later on, there was a few houses construction constructed around the area. But that's um, that's where I was staying at the time when I was the uh, cook, you might say. It's the word cook was kind of used quite loosely because <laughs> I didn't know how to cook. It was just somebody they gave me the service and said, "This is your service." <laughs> so, so you, I had so you was on, was on the job training. Farmer, you turn into a farmer. You turn into a cook. And it was all on the job. Yeah, and I lived all my life in the cities. So, <laughs> wow, what a transformation! Um, so, you, you like before we go into the, um, you know, that last time with Shila Prabhupada, just you just mentioned, you know, you went a cook, and you were put into this service. How did that feel? Um, and how did you able to? Because then I'm sure there's budding cooks out there right now um, mm. that may not know where to start there's students going to university there's people from all over the world that might want to know is like wow from that then suddenly you put into this like you're not just cooking for yourself but you're cooking for others as well so how did that feel and how did you able to learn uh well i guess the atmosphere was very supportive in the sense that there was a lot of enthusiasm for krishna consciousness and everything was focused on the serving Srila Prabhupada by serving his mission. And so for us, of course, it was the mission was narrowed to where we were, and that was serving the deities. So the community leader at the time, Kirtananda Swami, put a lot of emphasis on, on, on deity worship, making the deities the center of the community and providing as much, uh, what we say, well, you say simple opulence that was, was able to, we were able to provide at the time because there wasn't much wealth in the community. It was quite, in fact, we had no sources of income other than when devotees would came, come, they would give a little bit of their donations, of the money that they brought with them. So the community didn't have much support, but the deities became the main focus. And so being up into the uh, Brahmachari Ashram, we had a set of deities named Shishi Radha Nath. The main deities, of course, were Radha Vindavan Chandra, and then there was another set of deities called Radha Madhava. Radha Chandra were beautiful, beautiful uh, marble deities, full size. And Radha Vindavan Nath and Radha Madhava were smaller brass deities. And today you can go to New Vrindavan and you can see all three of those deities are, are on the main altar there. Oh, there you go. If anybody online has been there, comment with a thumbs up or a, a yes. So we just know who has been, who hasn't. And uh, it would be lovely to see who has. And also any questions you have about what you're hearing, please, please, please message in the group. And I've seen somebody putting their, their hands together. So Satya Sunda Dutta has. So thank you. So like that. So Maharaj, um, yourself, with the cooking itself, the starting that service and doing what you've done. And then, of course, that opportunity came to serve Srila Prabhupada. But I gather some were going to the airport and um, some were staying back. And I gather one of you was yourself. And... How was that situation? Can you paint the picture? Shila Prabhupada's coming, and well, this was this was quite a quite a scenario in the sense that there was a lot of a lot of enthusiasm to somehow or other be the person to go with uh, Kirtananda Swami to meet Shila Prabhupada at the at the uh, airport, and that became my desire also. I wanted to go. Of course, I was thinking of probably impossible, but still I was hoping against hope because my service was to stay in the kitchen. Mm. And practically I was the only cook. <laughs> so it wasn't like we had an entourage of cooks. I was just every, 
At that time, Prabhupada's palace was being built, and so most of the manpower was was directed towards constructing the palace. So there was only a few of us, Radhanath Swami, he was Radhanath Brahmachari at the time, who was the pujari, and uh, we had one devotee who would cut the wood, because everything was done by wood then. Uh, our cooking, our heating, everything was done by wood. And uh, I was the cook. So the three of us would be there throughout the day, and then the devotees would leave. The brahmacharis would leave after breakfast to go to build Prabhupada's palace, and then they would come back in the evening. So we, I was there practically alone. Well, of course, I had the uh, wonderful association of Radhana Swami during that time. And we were we would always take lunch together like that. So that was uh, that was something that we had every day. So my uh, cooking service was pretty much just maintaining the offerings for the deities throughout the day. And of course, we cooked breakfast for the devotees in the morning. But that was all. And uh, somehow or other, I can't even recall, but uh, I was either inspired to or came up with the idea to learn how to cook milk sweets. So that became my focus. And, uh, and so uh, someone mentioned about para, so I decided to learn that. So I focused on that as the, my main milk sweet, and so I was cooking para for the deities every day. And we always had a, a supply of para uh, waiting to be offered to the deities. It was a regular offering like that. So when the opportunity came to uh, go see Prabhupada, um, I was told, no, you'd have to stay back and maintain the kitchen. But we want devotees who could cook, because they had other devotees who were cooking at the other farms to cook for Srila Prabhupada and make various types of preparations, which would be taken to Prabhupada at the airport. So I was asked to do para. <laughs> the expert in it now, making it all the time. <laughs> it's, well, it's been quite a while. <laughs> And so, yeah, so I stayed back and um, tried to cook some para for Prabhupada. <laughs> but uh, somehow or other, and this is a little personal, but I became a little bit uh, emotionally disturbed by the fact that I wasn't able to come to see Prabhupada mm. in the sense that I wanted to go, but I couldn't go. And... Uh, it was something that was on my mind all the time when I was cooking the para. And uh, I was also listening to a beautiful bhajan, Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Burjami, the Brahma Samhita prayers, sung by a wonderful devotee named Bhartaraj. Bhartaraj was a, he was expert musician, expert singer. And uh, he, uh, I was listening to his chanting of the Brahma Samhita prayers at the same time trying to cook para and at the same time lamenting my situation. <laughs> and uh, so according to my estimation, the results of the cooking didn't come out. <laughs> I looked at it, I said, oh no. And I said, this is not going to be offered to Prabhupada. The quality is not right. Um, previously, I was under the impression that para should be light in color, uh, but this one came out dark. And uh, instead of uh, very, the texture was different. It was more like sticky rather than smooth. So I thought, all right, what I'll do is uh, I had some para that I had made for the deities that were ready to be offered. I'll put those aside, and when they come, I'll give them those para for Prabhupada. But Krishna had another plan. <laughs> so, 
And this plan was quite, uh, what to say, uh, inconceivable. <laughs> Is that um, I had not been in the kitchen when the devotees came around to collect the sweets to be given to Kirtananda Swami. So it was Radhanath Brahmachari, Radhanath Maharaj now, who came into the kitchen looking for the para, looking for me, but couldn't find it. And there was no, they had to have the, it then, so they were leaving. So, and Maharaj just recently told me this, and just it was just about a month ago, maybe a little bit more. He said, you know, I always thought from his words that Paris should be dark. <laughs> and I always thought, me, myself, that Paris should be light. So when he saw the dark para, he took that. Oh, I see. Which was the one that was, uh, I thought, wasn't offerable to Prabhupada. And so he took that one, and then they left. When I came back, I was thinking, I was cursing my fate, thinking Prabhupada was going to say, what a nonsense, get this guy out of the kitchen, you know. <laughs> so... But then again, the next day, when Kirtananda Swami returned, uh, he was quite uh, besides himself in happiness. And he wanted to relate it to me. He said, I saw Prabhupada do something he, he never does, or never did what I saw. He ate three of your para, one after another. <laughs> three, not one, but three. <laughs> three in a <the> row. <laughs> and... Uh, I didn't really know how to react to that, but I just felt like I was blessed, <laughs> really blessed like that. So um, somehow or other, by the mercy of Radhana Swami, Prabhupada got the para that I intended to cook for him. So, <laughs> And that's how the whole story unfolded. Uh, so... So uh, after that, I felt really fortunate that somehow Prabhupada liked Somehow he liked what I tried to prepare. <laughs> it, 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 it's such a nice way that that story happened. And not just one, but three. So you must yeah. have liked it. <laughs> yeah. And that was, that's why Kirtananda Swami was so I mean, incredulous. He, he said, I never saw Prabhupada do that before. It takes three of one thing in a row like that. So that that really kind of highlighted the whole, you know, event. We had a really nice comment coming just now. Uh, Lalita Nangi Radha Devi Dasi, cooked, soaked in genuine devotion, she says. So thank you. Thank you for that comment. And uh, you can definitely hear, you know, as, as Jandamuli Swami Maharaj is talking there, that Number one, he was not a cook at the start. He was not a farmer. And he was put into this, and it was the encouragement of the devotees uh, that helped him to do this. And, and that's a, I think that's a very nice uh, point as well, Chandra Moli Maharaj, that uh, there's, there's a saying, isn't there, that when, you know, a, a true friend or a true person will believe in your capabilities more than you believe in yourself. And that's how we can move forward. And like here you had that loving relationships around that helped you to do this. And even the peras, Shila Prabhupada had three peras, not just one. And I'm sure they were sugary as well. So it's uh it's amazing to see this this, this. so just on this this side, what would you say to those devotees right now that may be feeling, oh no, that service may be too hard? Or you know, or this service is like that. What what's the takeaway message that you would like to give to them? Uh, well, one thing I can reflect on, and which was quite a regular thing in the early days of Krishna consciousness, at least when Prabhupada was here, a lot of services were emergency services. So it was never like if a person had a qualification or had a desire to do it, if someone was available, a lot of times that service was given to them. So a lot of 
the experiences we had in doing services was learning the service as we were doing the service. Mm. And uh, that became a necessity a lot of times because uh, it wasn't about qualifications. It was about the need, need at the time. And of course, that's not always perfect because sometimes people will, could not come up to the standards or even perform the service. But um, it was just just the way it was in those days. So I just, think we've gotten away from that a little bit now. <laughs> it's it's because of you know the generation like of yourselves have helped in creating that solid foundation that we don't have to think about sinking in the sands or in the mud. You know, you've you've built that for us. It feels like from like you said, the necessity was there. You, it's like whatever was needed to be done, you would do. Like, right. like and uh, now it's come to a stage where devotees can now, in a way, choose what they would like to get involved in service and how they would like to serve. When those days it was a necessity, we had to do these things. There's no ifs or buts, but the loving community was what made it built. So, mm. yes, I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from, and and that's why it's so nice to talk directly to disciples of Shila Prabhupada and hear about those struggles of how it was because it wasn't plain sailing, uh, but because of what all of you have done, we can do what we can do now and hopefully serve a little more. Uh, in any little capacity we can. So, and uh, like uh, Simita said, like the tagline of this place: "No service is big or small. Serve your spiritual master with love and devotion." So, the title of this was "No service is too big or small." So, please, everyone, remember that. And um, I just want to now bring on to that's not where you just stopped. You've been doing so many other services uh, in 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 this mission. And one of them notably has to be to do with, uh, you know, helping, showing that compassionate light to prisoners and going into prisons and helping them. Can I ask, how did that come about uh, uh, of, you know, how, how did that happen? Uh, and then you thought, because after that, I know in UK as well, this is something big and different parts of the world, they are doing this. But, you know, you were pioneering this at such an early time. Uh, well, I was I can't actually take the, any any credit in that regard in the sense that the pioneer was done by one of my god brothers who inspired me to get involved and he was the one that first started it. Of course, if we go back in history, we find that it was Srila Prabhupada was the original prison preacher in 1962, even before Prabhupada came to America. He came to the Tihar jail in Delhi and um, gave a, a talk. And there's a record there. There's a, actually a letter that Prabhupada wrote to the jailer, Mr. Pori, uh, explaining how he felt that this, that this is a wonderful way to reach people with Krishna consciousness. This audience is perfect. So that was Prabhupada in 1962, and Prabhupada again, Lokanath Swami Maharaj also went with Prabhupada, I believe, in 1972, again in India. I'm not sure of the particular jail they went to. It might have been the same place. But uh, yeah, so Prabhupada was the first person, at least we can say, within our society to do prison preaching. <laughs> wow. Well, so there you go. So it's 1962. This is when it's yeah. the first, first taste of it. And um, so this naturally, for you, what was your inclination into getting into this? Yeah. So as, as I mentioned, there was a god brother. His name was Chandra Shekhar. And he's still very active in prison preaching now. And, uh, and he was writing letters on the average of 20 letters a day to inmates. Um, and then he got very much inspired. In fact, he started a whole series of writing the heads of the uh, you know, penal institutions if uh, he could send Srila Prabhupada's books in. And he got some, very little response, but he, he built on that and then gradually 
he started developing a clientele with inmates where they were writing letters regularly and sending in books. So in our new Vrindavan community, we had, uh, we had a situation where one of our uh, devotees wound up in jail, in the local jail. Hmm. So I started to go as part of a group of devotees to visit him. And uh, that was my first experience with going in jails. And at the same time, I had connected with uh, Chandra Shekhar Prabhu, and he, he inspired me to join the letter writing team to take up some of the letters that he was writing. So then, after experiencing going into jails, um, it just started to snowball from then. I found myself doing more and more correspondence with inmates and then making arrangements to visit some of them. Um, a lot of the visits weren't programs, but they were just visits where I would meet the inmate and we would just, you know, talk about Krishna consciousness, find out a little bit about their personal life. And that's how everything uh, developed with me. That was in the 90s. And then uh, later on, it just started to uh, increase more and more. But the main part of our prison preaching, and it's always been and still is, is sending Srila Prabhupada's books into jails. And so that's increasing all around the world now in different places. Wow. So these, um, what book do you usually send? You know, if you've seen somebody that's, is it, which, which book is the, between the prison inmates that you found, that is the book that seems to be the one that connects with them most? Well, we found that, uh, what was it? Uh, what was this one thick paperback book called? Hmm. It slips my mind now. It's a very, it's about 350 pages. Oh, I can't remember the name of the book. Uh, it's a simple title, but I can't remember. Science of Self-Realization? You, you got it. <laughs> yes. yes. The Science of Self-Realization. So we found that that book uh, was a book that really attracted the inmates. And there was a lot of, you know, dialogue in the book, you know, like, the uh, Prabhupada talking with other people back and forth, and a lot of philosophy also. And nicely written, easy to read, and a lot a lot of material to, to work with. And then from there, after they became a little interested, we started sending in Bhagavad Gita. That became the main book after that. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's how it, that's, that's so, so everybody out there, Science of Self-Realization. Uh, check it out. If you haven't checked it out, it is something I personally find uh, it's, it's one of uh, the ones that really connected with myself as well. Uh, so when you said that number of pages, I was like, okay, got an idea now. Mm -hmm. But um, so with the with this service that's it's been going on since the 1980s, you've been, you've been doing the prison services. Is there any, because it's been going on for some time now, what is your, what is that inspiration that keeps you motivated to carry on? Was it something by Prabhupada? What, what is it? Uh, uh, well, the, the motivation, aside from the, the idea of reaching out to others with Krishna consciousness, is just how much these inmates really appreciate Krishna conscious. Although they can't really practice fully, um, somehow or other, many of them, they just embrace the philosophy completely. And then also the chanting. So around the world, there are, I would say, thousands of inmates now who are chanting the holy names and regularly reading Prabhupada's books. And, and some of them are very active in trying to spread Krishna consciousness within the jails. Wow. And we have some, so many amazing, amazing, amazing experiences coming from them and also personal experiences that I have when I visited the jails because we've done programs in the jails also. 
and saying that, um, uh, Lalita Nangi Radha Devidasi is asking, can you share any particular story of an inmate becoming a devotee? Or <sighs> well, there's 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 many, but one that's outstanding in my mind, which is kind of a landmark pro, uh, story. Um, we are preaching in one country, which I cannot mention because we're not allowed to be in that country. <laughs> And uh, one of our um, uh, devotees happened to get a position as a Hindu chaplain in, the, in a particular jail in that country. And so um, he was there and he was trying to, you know, uh, give Bhagavad Gita classes and, and bring inmates in. So one day he asked the the, uh, the head jailer if there was any uh, person of the Hindu origin who would be interested in coming to his Bhagavad Gita classes. So they said, well, we'll see. And after some time they responded back by saying there is one man. He is uh, actually on death row. He's due to be executed soon. And uh, so uh, we'll ask him to come. And so he came. And uh, he was, he came and wasn't so interested at first, but then he somehow rather started listening to the classes and lectures, talks, discussions. And uh, his interest really peaked fast. Pri I should mention prior to that, he was in denial about the crime that he was accused of. Hmm. And uh, along with blaming other persons for his situation, his parents could not even talk to him because when they would come, he would always complain about others. After coming for a few months, actually a little, it was actually less than a few months, maybe a couple of months, he uh, changed completely changed, started to really appreciate Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's uh, words, started regularly learning the verses, and became practically the most enthusiastic person in the group. So much so that now he admitted that, yes, I did the crime, and uh, he became somewhat remorseful and repentant, and... Uh, his whole demeanor, attitude completely changed. Uh, after some time, that, uh, that time for his execution came very close. And so just before then, uh, he had asked the jailers, when you take me away, can I keep a copy of the Bhagavad Gita with me? <laughs> And he told the devotees, he said, I want to become a devotee of Krishna in my next life. <laughs> so now, of course, uh, he's really, he's lost his fear of being executed. He just, he's just thinking that soon I'll get a new body and I'll be a devotee of Krishna in my next life. He was expressing this. And so when they were taking him away for his execution, he uh, was walking along with the jailers and uh, usually, uh, and he was waving goodbye to his friends who were in some of the cells as he was passing. And he was saying, I'm gonna be a devotee of Krishna in my next life. Uh, of course, he went to his execution with the Bhagavad Gita in his hand and the uh, jailers came back to the devotee, or the, the Hindu chaplain said, you know, what did you do to him? We never saw anything like that. He, was, he wasn't at all resistant. He said, when we're taking a person away, we have to drag them. But this person, he was just walking. And so they were amazed to see the transformation in him. And they were curious to see how he became transferred, transformed. Wow. So this is an amazing story how a person went from one, one extreme to another simply by 
coming in contact with the devotee and the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. And Paul Pitts is saying, all glories to you, Chandramuli Swami Maharaj. I was also involved in this service a few years back from both sides with Chandrasekhar Prabhu. This is an amazing service. Um, it's gone, uh, prison ministry is still there, I believe. Anyway, thank you for your uh, kind service. I have also been to Nivarindavan. So thank you for, thank you for letting Hare me Krishna, thank, thank you. you. Paul, it's really kind of you. And um, I've just had, and so people are really being touched by that. You know, it's, it's, you're just showing the, the power of the holy name, the power of Srila Prabhupada, his books, and how it can transform someone's life. This is, you're hearing it, you know, I'm hearing this for the first time, everybody. And it, it, it's transformational what you're doing, Chandramuni Maharaj and the team. And so thank you for sharing that. That's yeah, there's many devotees around the world who are actively engaged in, in prison preaching. And uh, we have a, two wonderful, wonderful, amazing, dedicated devotees in the UK mm -hmm. that are bringing Prabhupada's books everywhere into jails in the UK. Just before this uh, lockdown with the COVID, um, happened. I was in London prior to that, and uh, we were doing regular jail programs, going in, meeting the inmates, giving classes, and bringing books into the libraries. It was just, like I could say, phenomenal, the success we were having. The different jails were opening up, welcoming us with the books, and Every time we had a captivated audience of at least anywhere from six to 12 inmates for our program. Oh, wow. And, 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 and just on that, uh, Chudamani Dasi is saying here, Hare Krishna Maharaj has book club reading with interactive sessions in preaching, prison preaching been implemented, especially for young offenders. So there, is, there seems to be that that's happening right now. That's what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Uh, a book club reading? I mean, something that is organized through a particular, through a book club? So, like, uh, I think she's, like, just all getting together. They're reading. They're doing maybe systematic reading of the Bible. Yeah, books. that's happening in different places. Right now, around the world, uh, uh, America has the most uh, inmates practicing Krishna consciousness. Um, and, of course... I've been preaching in Slovenia and Croatia. We did, we were doing programs for the last five, six years here. We were able to get all of Srila Prabhupada's books into all the jails in Croatia. All the books that had been translated into the local language, which were many. Wow. So that was uh, done by a wonderful devotee named Maha Simha, you know, who worked very hard and had some connection with some, one of the ministers who gave permission, and uh, the result was we got Prabhupada's books into all the prison libraries in Croatia. Wow, this so, is mind blowing. And actually, for everybody out out there, if you want to get, uh, a, you know, a copy, there's a there's a book being released by Maharaj some time back, and it's called uh, Holy Jail. And um, you can get it on Amazon. And also there's a website as well called www.holyjail.com. If you want to know more information, go check out that website. It has all the information you need uh, on there. And, um, yeah, it sounds like a really interesting read as well. So thank you for compiling this and, and, and helping others to understand the, the jail situation, which is uh, great. And also, you know, if you want to know more, about uh, what Chandramuli Maharaj is doing. Uh, he's got his website as well, www.cmswami.com. So check that out as well. So, all right, I want to come on to, you know, now yourself. Um, and, I, you know, we're aware that COVID has been around and everyone, and, and of course, 
you we're so thankful that you are feeling how are you feeling right now are you you know I, it's really great that you're talking to us and that when we heard we're like yes we'll speak to chandra Murli swami Maharaj. oh but he needs to recover you know and and then suddenly we got a response to say yes why don't you speak then we realize you're speaking every day you're 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 online you're on zoom and you're doing so it was just so inspiring to hear and we're just wondering how are you at the moment how are you recovering well, by, by the I guess by the prayers from the devotees, Krishna's mercy has uh, allowed me to keep my strength up where I can uh, continue on my services. Um, I'm not what you could say, you know, in the best situation in terms of health, but it's not something that is causing me to, uh, you know, give up my activities. I'm okay. There's points of being tired, but other than that, that's fine. I'm fine. By Krishna's mercy, the devotees' prayers, actually. Wow. No, it's it's very inspiring, and uh, praying. You know, we're all praying that you uh, completely recover and uh, take this exponentially with the prison service and what you're doing, all these services, because you're. Europe is a place now that you're quite regular at. Of course, you know, we've seen you in the UK. I, I remember you coming a few times down for our 24 hour kirtan in Birmingham, then also for Manchester in Iskon, Manchester held kirtans over there. And, you know, you coming down and gracing us with your presence. So now at the moment you're in, I, I believe you were saying uh, Slovenia, if I'm right. Um, yeah. The capital of Ljubljana. Mm -hmm. And and, and um, so what's, of course, we got locked down and it's happening. But uh, how are you now, uh, as I said about Zooms, but how are you reaching out to individuals and also, you know, with the prison services, etc.? How's that? How's that happening? At the well, um, with, with, with regular programs, we I, I do a program every day at uh, one o'clock uh, uh, UK time and to mostly disciples and a few others and then uh, throughout the week i do a program in uh, with the devotees in charlotte north carolina and now also in harrisburg pennsylvania so uh, others are coming forward and asking for you know classes so giving classes on different subjects mostly Srimad bhagavatam like that so staying busy you certainly are and uh one person called uh sharma rani devi dasi said gurumaj's preaching is ongoing non-stop despite being unwell all glories to your wonderful service dear guru dear so i put i put that out so thank you so much and i think now like we've, we've heard about chila Prabhupada. We've heard about the prison service. We've heard about, you know, your, your, right now, your situation and how you're still preaching out there. And we're coming towards the end of our session soon. So if there's any questions, please do bring them out. Uh, and as we've been going along, we've been trying to pick up some of those questions. So can I ask, in these situations we're in right now, uh, to the devotees that are listening right now, and this is now being uh, streamed on multiple uh, channels. Uh, one is Lokanath Swami Maharaj's channel. One is Jayapataka Swami Maharaj's channel. We've got Mayapur TV in the different channels, Bhagavad Gita channel, and some of the channels I have. And on that, for those audiences, is there any advice, especially in this time right now, of some places going in lockdown, some are, you know, uncertain about the future and how they may be able to try to, should we say, cover path forward. I think, you know, every situation that we find ourselves, there's always opportunities to increase our Krishna consciousness and also increase our service. So here I find that preaching is uh, of course it's online and i'm also giving classes at the temple because i'm about two doors away from the temple so yeah, occasionally yeah. i give evening bhagavad-gita classes at the temple but um 
it's a great time for reading, for studying, for chanting, and for, for preaching. Um, not having to travel has given me, and I think maybe the devotees in general can also understand this, more time to go into their own personal life and uh, mm. you know, put more concentration on hearing and chanting and also reaching out to others. Uh, there's a blessing with not traveling because traveling takes up so much time and so much energy, so much expense. So with that, all that wiped away, I, can, I found it more, more time for focusing on uh, reading, chanting, and taking the opportunity to uh, preach. <laughs> yes. And on that, Sri Devi Dasi is asked, of all the ways to spread Krishna consciousness, what's the best and most effective way? Yeah. Well, of course, just speaking what, what Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said book distribution remains the foremost way to spread Krishna consciousness. Uh, that may not always be as easy as it was, but we can still do it through the media online making Prabhupada's books available and through different venues. And devotees are doing that in certain areas. Um, and of course, uh, inspiring people to chant the holy names. Nowadays, I think from one of my experience, which is not so much out there, uh, people are more open to some kind of uh, solution or some kind of situation that will get them out of their present uh, struggles with this uh, because the things are actually becoming more and more restrictive all around the world now and people's lives are being pushed into uh, a more more of a struggle to maintain and so um, people I think are, are need something that they can you know find some uh, happiness or some solace and some preaching the holy names the glories of the holy name i think remains very much foremost and i think there were some devotees are out there and meeting people and giving the holy names at different places so that's going on and there's also programs on online where devotees are having kirtan programs, japa sessions, Srimad Bhagavatam discussions. I found that that's been on the increase from my experience with devotees that there's a lot of more, a lot more groups are starting to formulate where they're discussing Srila Prabhupada's books and uh, uh, reading together, chanting together like that. So, uh, and that's, you know, that's where we get our spiritual shakti from, hearing and chanting. No, thank you. So, there you have it. And um, I also just want to bring up, because you got a, 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 new, a new book recently come out as well called Forbidden Voices. Um, and which is also everybody available on Amazon. You can at the top where Myers is sitting. I've just changed the picture. You'll see it. That's what it looks like. Um, can I ask uh, about this book? So the other one was Holy Jail, but now Forbidden Voices. Uh, because I was looking through and I was like, oh, this is a nice book. What's this about? Let me ask Maharaj. <laughs> so I thought I'll ask you. Uh, yeah. On there's a slight difference in presentation, although both subjects are the same, and that is uh, prison preaching. Um, the first book is broad. It has the history, it has a lot of personal stories coming from devotees. It has accounts of prison preaching programs. It's more all-encompassing with all aspects of prison preaching from the inside and the outside. That's the first book. The second book, uh, Forbidden Voices is really focused on the inmates. It's from the inside out. So it's their realizations, their uh, 
essays they write of their glorifications of Srila Prabhupada, uh, poetry, uh, artwork. There's a whole section of artwork that's included in the book. So the second book is kind of giving emphasis on hearing from the inmates uh, like that. So that's that's the focus on the second book. So. Fantastic. And, and you can get everybody, you can get this at Amazon.com. Check out Amazon, put the name of the book in, and uh, that's where you can you can get these. So please do check them out. Uh, yeah, and if there if there is any difficulties in attaining the book, they can write to me, and I'll excellent. arrange for arrange for devotees to receive the books. Mm -hmm. So on on that basis, uh, we have your website, which is here. So I gather there's a contact section in there. Uh, so they, is that the best way to contact you? Uh, Maharaj? Um, well, I guess that's one way, um, but I'm not so much on the website. I think a personal email would be the best. Excellent. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that email address, if you don't mind, uh, then I can put it up for everybody. Is that yeah, it's it's my name, Chandra Mali, but not Swami, just Chandra Mali. Yeah. Uh, five, uh, uh, no, five, no, no. Chandra Mali five eight six five eight six at gmail dot com gmail dot com and it's coming up right now everybody so it's ready for there we go yeah so, Chandra Mali five eight six at gmail dot com so if you want to know more or you want to know where you can get it from if you can't get it from Amazon then uh. His Holiness Chandramuli Swami Maharaj will able to assist that. So it, what a nice excuse to even just give you a contact. Do we have it now? So thank you, thank you, thank you for, for setting mm -hmm. that up. Um, and also, Maharaj, did you know, uh, because of Kartik, we've got uh, His Holiness Lokanath Swami Maharaj and the Padiatra Ministry. They, like you're talking about, because, you know, to preach out there and to help even devotees in these times of this COVID, uh, because of the Padiatra cannot, not the Padiatra, the Raj Mandala cannot happen in person. They've created a, a, um, an app that you can now join as uh, virtually. So every day it's been going on. And I just wanted everybody out there that this, you know, if you want to get involved, this is the annual 34th Raj Mandala Parikram. So just go to www to register. This is www.bit.ly forward slash online VMP. And when you do that, you will get all the information. It's not too late, uh, but you must do each uh, session at a time. It won't unlock the others until you've done the first one. So it's like a being there actually. And you've got to go via the actual Parikram etiquette where you go to one place to another, you cannot skip. So it's going to be amazing. So Maharaj, this is happening right now as well. So um, I just wanted to, everybody out there to know. And finally, Maharaj, thank you so much for your time. You know, like you said, you're, you're, you're recovering. You're, you're, you've got all this going on. You have so much correspondence happening, but you made time to come on. So uh, from the... It's got Mayapur and the Mayapur TV team and personally for myself. I just want to say thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having you on again at some point, if that's okay with you. Thank you very much. It was a great honor and a privilege to be able to be here and have an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Stay safe. And Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.